Good afternoon, everyone. It's Deb Sparks from the Centre of Excellence for Prescribed Burning here. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce um, Professor David Bowman today to present our webinar on pyrogeography and fire management. I managed to hear David give this talk in Perth last year and I thought it was a really interesting in the way it combined a number of aspects of um, fire management, biology, ecology, cultural management and um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And so with that I'll just hand over to you David. Okay, um, thank you very much. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a, a pleasure to be able to give this talk. Um, and obviously, where uh, webinars are becoming uh, certainly mainstream, so it's a good experience um, for all of us doing this. Certainly for me, I think this is my first webinar. So I'm going to be talking about um, pyrogeography and the relevance to fire management. Pyrogeography. Um, is a complicated idea. It's a, a field that I, I guess I would like to say I'm uh, developing or pioneering. Um, and it's more than just thinking about uh, simple geographical patterns of fire, as I will explain. So hopefully the next slide will reveal itself. Okay. So really the premise that, um, that I, I want to start this um, uh, talk off with, and, and, and I guess it's sort of certainly framed by the circumstances we find ourselves in because of the pandemic, um, fire science is a crisis discipline and a discipline in crisis. And I think that that sense of crisis um, is now permeating pretty well all uh, disciplines and all practices and all thought because um, what we've experienced this summer uh, with the fires in Australia and what we're now experiencing with the pandemic are showing some inherent vulnerabilities in our civilization and our practice. And I use this, uh, I think, very evocative picture from the Paradise Fire, which I believe happened in uh, uh, 2018 in California. Um, I've lost track of the number of fire disasters um, in California and in Australia. They're all sort of converging into one almost continuous caravan of fire disasters. And this caravan of fire disasters is sort of walking into the future as fire managers and fire scientists, we really are in a crisis discipline. And certainly from my background, you might want to reflect on your background, I never signed into this uh, uh, career thinking that I would be uh, here in 2020 talking about um, a caravan of crises. Um, and I think that Fire science has always had an eye to fire disasters, but it hasn't really been completely preoccupied by them. And it, it's had certainly some traditions or thought processes that are increasingly struggling with the challenges we're finding. And I think for me, another way of thinking about, um, you know, the shocks that are going to these crises, um, the Gondwanic vegetation in Tasmania, another paradise that's been burnt, um, really, I think, underscored the fact of climate change and the, the very uncertain future we have, how we're going to actually manage our landscapes as the world heats and as fires are able to penetrate into refugia. This is a Gondwanic refugia um, we're looking at a world that's really being turned upside down by fire. And one of the concerning <coughs> features of this fire crisis um, is that as these fire crises are escalating, the amount of money that we're investing in fire management is actually increasing. And that's a, 
a really interesting uh, thought about this coupling. How bad would the fatalities and economic losses be if it wasn't for that investment? So, you know, we're seeing these um, steadily rising uh, major fatality events, increasing economic uh, losses, and of course, this is not even updated to what's happened uh, this summer. But there's also, in tandem, this increasing expenditure. And it's um, this coupled system leads us to ponder and, and wonder about the sustainability of the operation. I mean, what's going to happen? Do we just keep pouring money into trying to stem an ever-increasing flood of uh, major fire events? How are we going to get our heads around this? And one of the things that we know, some work I did with some American colleagues, that where the fire disasters, and these are the blue dots, are occurring, um, oh, sorry, the red triangles, where fire uh, disasters are occurring, occurring, the red triangles amongst these major, these are the most 500 intense uh, using a MODIS uh, archive. Uh, I think it was uh, a 13 year record at this stage, was published in 2017, even this analysis was very quickly made obsolete by the Chilean fires and of course has been completely obsolete by the Australian 2019-20 uh, fires. But what we see with the Red Triangle uh, disasters is that they're concentrated in places that are going to experience climate change. So there's no question that the sustainability of our practice is, is under threat by, by climate change. We're on this um, treadmill or escalator, if you will, that there are going to be more um, disasters associated with more extreme fire weather events. So what I want to do now is that's sort of framing the problem, and you're all aware of the problem. Um, but probably what we don't do well in fire management and fire science is to step back and to actually think about this and think about what really the problem is and more fundamentally what fire is. And um, maybe you have done this, but maybe what I'm going to tell you will surprise you. I don't know. Something that I spend a lot of my life thinking about shapes my research practice. I think the, the most critical thing about fire is it's very difficult to think about fire in a fundamental way, like in a simple physical or chemical way. And you might wonder why that is. You'd say, well, that's ridiculous. Fire, by definition, is a physiochemical process. Um, it's very easy to think about it in a fundamental way. Well, I have to disagree with you. Why? If you look at these two pictures, the blue dome on the right-hand side is a flame in space. That's zero gravity. And the thing about fire on Earth is it's very much connected to gravity, buoyancy, the atmosphere, the nature of the atmosphere. And we know from the geological record that the oxygen concentration at the moment, 21%, has varied between around 30 and 13%. Uh, and that means that in the geological record of Earth, flames, the flammability of vegetation have fundamentally changed in response to, to just the condition of the atmosphere, let alone if there was another planet with life with a different gravity, it would have different flames, different fire behaviours. I, I find this really mind-boggling because it cuts away from the reductionist uh, trope 
the reductionist argument. You may know what reductionists are. They're people who go, oh, well, we just have to think about it in very cut and dried fundamental terms. Well, you can't. And if you do, you could wind up with the spherical cow problem. And you know the story of the spherical cows, the dairy farmers who wanted to improve efficiency and they recruited physicists to help them because they thought, well, physicists are going to be smarter and better than any other science. And they got the report back and the physicists said, well, let's assume cows are spherical. Um, and they realised the mistake they'd made because it's contingent biology. The other thing about fire is that it's a global phenomenon. The scale and the frequency of fire has only really been understood since uh, the advent of satellites. Uh, now we have very good quality data, now particularly with uh, things like Himawari 8 geostationary satellites. We can actually pretty well see, and many of you probably did see, the unfolding uh, fire events pretty well in real time from, from space. So it's a global process. And in that global process, there's a very strong biological signal, as a very common sight for Australians, but probably underestimate how utterly remarkable it is. These epicormic uh, strands, they're actually not buds, but eat the bark, um, are activated when a fire defoliates the canopy. Um, we actually don't understand the hormonal processes that control the development of those buds that are sitting there dormant until they're triggered by a fire event. But we do know that uh, looking at uh, the evolution of these epicormic strands, some work that we did several years ago, uh, combining phylogenetics and anatomy, that these strands evolved at least 60 million years ago, which underscores the antiquity of the covenant between eucalyptus and fire. The thing about fire is fire affects food web. You go to a savanna here in Kruger National Park, there's this extraordinary like coral reef level diversity of mammalian herbivores and their predators which are all coupled with fire because it's actually a savanna and savannas burn, but the animals and the plants are all interconnected in these extraordinarily beautiful food webs which can increase or decrease uh, uh, animal abundance and different species of plants. Atmospheric fire, here we're seeing a, a blow-up pyrocumulonimbus. These events um, are now really reframing our understanding of the coupling of the biosphere to the atmosphere via fire. Pyrocumulonimbus events are of really major Earth system significance as a mechanism to transport both energy and matter into the stratosphere. Um, and they were once uncommon, and now they're becoming frighteningly common. And they're frightening because once they occur, the behaviour of the fires that are driving these things becomes extreme and unpredictable. The geomorphological fire, if you look at landscapes, and here we're in southwest Tasmania, you can see clear patterns between interplay between fire, vegetation, terrain, and soils. The soils in this setting are largely organic. And you can see that the legacy effects of frequent burning um, can't be underestimated. That frequent burning in the landscape is an extremely powerful uh, process that's shaping vegetation cover, which in turn shapes fire activity and soil development. Uh, cultural fire, I've been privileged 
for the last 20 years to work in Arnhem Land with Aboriginal people living on their country who've basically got an unbroken tradition by management. I was only thinking about this today. It's quite likely that that tradition of fire management doesn't just stretch back to colonisation of 50, 60,000 years ago, but actually stretches back into the origin of our species. And what we often overlook, we look at an Aboriginal fire culture, we overlook that actually all cultures in flammable landscapes, which is nearly all cultures, including Europeans, had fire traditions. It's just that they've been lost or overwritten by modernity, industrialisation, colonisation and so on. Biodiversity. We, I think, have a habit of thinking about fire as some sort of uniform or a consistent thing that we can think about. But what we overlook is that there might actually not be a shared awareness. There might not be a, a commonality even in the concepts or the terms or the relationships or behaviours. And this is what I would call biodiversity, biodiversity. In, and there's this marvellous book by Christine Erickson, Gender and Wildfire, that really apprehended this. Uh, issue and uh, I would commend you to read this book. She's got a beautiful vignette of just how clumsy our thinking has been and, and that is that the costumes, the firefighting uniforms for the firefighters were modelled on a male not, not considering whoever was developing these uniforms firefighting uh, for the front line that there would be women, and this created all sorts of problems for the women who were on the fire front. Um, and that just is the tip of the iceberg because it affects communities, how communities think and feel about fire and fire risk and fire management um, and fire messaging. And I put down the bottom, and you may chuckle, uh, Nigel Clark is a social scientist uh, who wrote this very unusual uh, article, Queer Fire, Ecology, Combustion and Pyrosexual Desire for a journal called Feminist Review, which you may or may not know. And in it, he's actually really taking the issue of fire diversity to the absolute extremes. And I think this is important. There's a place for uh, social theorists to to think outside the box and to really challenge our thinking and our assumptions. And then I would come to another way of thinking about fire as Anthropocene fire, which I think is really graphically captured in this photograph of a burning coal mine uh, in Victoria, the Morwell coal mine fire. Um, in the behind is the the power generation from burning the coal and the uh, uh, transmission lines across. And it really summarises the problem of the Anthropocene, that we burn hydrocarbons, we change the climate, we get more extreme fire weather, and even the coal deposits that we're mining become combustible. And, and we see this loop, this feedback, between uh, climate, climate change, carbon, fire, completely different way of thinking about fire as being an expression of the Anthropocene. Stephen J. Pine, the American historian, uh, prefers to use the word the pyrocene, um, which I, I quite like. I see that as, um, as playful and useful, the way of thinking about these couplings and um, the Russian dolls of fire and climate, climate change, hydrocarbons and, and modernity. <clears throat> so what I've just tried to do in that section is illustrate my case that you cannot 
think about fire from one vantage. That is a fool's errand. That is going to take you certainly some places, but it's going to stop you going to really the core of the problem. So it's not an argument against thinking about fire as being a biological or a social or a fundamental physiochemical process. It's just that those single disciplinary lenses are incapable of capturing uh, the complexity, the nuance, and I would argue the solutions. So, so how do we do what I'm proposing we do, which is apply pyrogeography to thinking about fire? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to illustrate some philosophical traps that can go with certain lines of thinking, and then I'm going to try to show some remedies. So the very first point I'm making here is our conceptions of fire, this picture, a fire behavior model, um, an experiment, whatever, is not fire. Fire is a dynamical process. Fire is situated not only in the physical environment, but in a cultural environment and a historical context. And you can't capture that easily in one image or one word or one phrase or one experiment or one model. What's the, the philosophical uh, issue? It's, uh, the philosophers have a term for this. It's called reification. And Marguerite, the surrealist, captured this issue really well. Um, almost 100 years ago, the treachery of images. This is not a pipe. What he was signaling is that the things that we believe to be real are approximations. They are not real. So our models and our assumptions and our arguments and our thoughts are all approximations. They are not real. So we have to be conscious of that when we're communicating or thinking or arguing, debating or designing um, solutions to fire management, that our theories or constructs and models aren't actually necessarily capturing the complexity of fire. Now, as I showed um, in, in that word complexity, fire is a really complicated process. There are webs of both biological and social interactions, processes, and feedbacks. Uh, on the left-hand side, we see a, uh, an approximation in one of our papers where we were thinking about the impossibility or the difficulty, the challenge of modeling fire into the future because you've got all of these complex interacting processes um, which have feedback, which are very, very difficult to capture. But the big one on the right-hand side is, is uh, a humans. Humans really are the stumbling block for projections of future fire activity. Uh, humans can cause fires, they can fight fires, they can live in flammable environments, they can cause the climate to change, they can uh, suppress fire, they can exclude fire, they can, you know, organize themselves to resist fire. Humans have got lots and lots of things they can do. They're in a culture, they're in a governance system, uh, they have a history, they have differences um, between different cultures, different peoples, different nations, but there are also commonalities. So fire is a complex thing. So we need to simplify, it's obvious. But the process of simplification means that when we make a model, we try to, a good model at least, tries, in my opinion, a good model at least, tries to really cut out the, the annoying little details and go to the real core issues 
um, and we simplify. And these are very, very useful uh, models because if we make models that are so complex that they are actually trying to mirror reality, then the output of our complex model is almost impossible to understand. We have to use the same approaches to understand the outputs as we use to try to understand reality. So we're not really moving forward. As uh, my uh, colleague George Perry at the University of Auckland likes to say, and he is a modeler, a spatial modeler, you have to be re careful of replacing one black box with another black box. Because if you don't, then you just end up really with no progress. So uh, you may never have heard of the Endians. Um, the Endians actually come from Gulliver's Travels. You may remember the Lilliputians that tied Gulliver down. Well. The Endians had an argument. Uh, uh, the, the Lilliputians had an argument about which end of an egg to open. And they had a hundred year war. And in Swift's satire, what Swift was really getting at, and maybe he was talking about Protestants and Catholics, maybe he was talking about other divisions in his society, that you actually have to be very careful of creating binary arguments that suck out all of the energy that would otherwise be able to solve the problem because the creative, productive people are belting each other up about a fundamentally a philosophical difference of opinion. The Indians became uh, uh, an idea when there was a debate in computer science between coding very large numbers or characterizing very large numbers there was no agreement on how to do this, and there was a major debate in computer science called the Big Endians versus the Little Endians, and the debate ended up in a draw because there were arguments for both sides, but an enormous amount of energy was spent trying to show that one approach was better than another. And here I'm arguing that we have to be careful in fire science that we don't fall into this trap. Uh, models are better than empirical studies. Reductionism is better than holism. Data-based analyses are better than narrative-based analyses. My management method uh, is better than your management method. And that getting confused about outcomes and methods fixating on management method rather than on management outcome. So there's opportunities galore in a complicated system to become distracted by philosophical debate. And in a crisis, as I said, this is a crisis discipline, we don't have a lot of time. So we've got to be, not, not, not to disagree, but to be mindful that there are going to be other ways of thinking about reality. <laughs> so what I'm arguing here is that what I call myself now, the Professor of Pyrogeography and Pyre Science, is an avowed statement of my commitment to being a transdisciplinary, a transdiscipline, a disciplinary researcher and that demands a diversity of perspectives. It demands to be comfortable with difference and diversity and the fact that you have to change gears about what the basis of evidence is even, and what the norms of research practice are and how you would think about a problem. And the best way to do that is by combining different disciplines in transdisciplinary teams. And, you know, broadly, I think there's biological and physical sciences. There's all of these really important uh, traditions, be it soil science or evolution, forestry, conservation biology, hydrology, and the social, social sciences, 
society and culture, history, geography, archaeology, creative arts, and then, of course, in the physical sciences, physics, epidemiology, mathematical modelling. They all become pressed into service to help us think about these terribly difficult, complicated problems. Now, I'm just going to step back and ask a question. Why is it that after these disasters, and we're now in such a modality, why is it that there's a scarcity of transdisciplinary thought? Why is it? that most often the lawyers or the historians and not the scientists or the managers are able to step up and explain to the society what's going on. And I give two examples. The uh, Royal Commission report, the Victorian bushfires, 2009, and Bill Gamage's book, The Biggest Estate on Earth. But there are many, many other examples of where really people who don't have the technical expertise in fire science, fire management, are the people who are actually narrating the argument, sketching the, 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 the ground for interested uh, people and policy makers to understand. And I think that that scarcity of transdisciplinary thought signals really one of the key points I'm trying to make, that we are, uh, as people like to say, too involved in our silos and not enough in crosstalk. So you could be uh, sitting here and going, well, this is just talk. This is just verbiage. Who, who is going to show me the real evidence that this synthetic or transdisciplinary pyrogeographic approach actually has got any use whatsoever? So I will now share with you some of my research practice of, as a pyrogeographer of how I've been thinking about these problems. And the first um, example is the pivotal role of case studies. This uh, paper uh, is in a very, very minor journal, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports. This paper uh, reported an unusual disease in Los Angeles, 1981. It's one of the most cited and famous papers um, probably in medical science because it was the first report of practitioners who were seeing an unusual disease that seemed to be associated with gay men. And that disease became known as HIV AIDS, that they were looking at this strange disease and they were wondering about what's going on here. And they wrote a report, a case study, a case note. And then that helped motivate, um, you know, the huge revolution that's taken place right down now to drug therapies and control of a very nasty um, disease. And, you know, it's a really a very major success story and a great example of looking at a problem, reporting it just as a case note to alert people there is a problem, not necessarily offering a solution, just saying there is a problem. So what I'm um, doing in my practice is that I'm trying uh, to write case studies one of the reasons I uh, motivated the founding of the new online journal, FIRE, uh, which uh, I hopefully you will know, it's a very useful journal. And one of the things we did when we set up the FIRE journal was explicitly creating a space for case studies. Uh, an example of a case study uh, is the report that I wrote with uh, a group of Chilean and American um, scientists on the globally extreme 2017 Chilean fires. Uh, I was invited to Chile, and it it just uh, it just astonished me the things I was seeing, and and I thought I have to package this, I have to document this, and it was actually quite a process to find the right journal to 
and published this article because, you know, other journals would say, oh, yeah, but this is just a case note, you know, and that's really missing the point of how important case studies are. So I've just illustrated. And the sorts of things we want in case studies are consideration of causes, severity, evolutionary context, ecology and biogeography, environmental impacts, socio-ecological relationships, human harms, economic and political repercussions. And I would suggest that there are going to be, and I know because I'm reviewing many of them, a whole uh, plethora of reports on the recent fires. Um, and I'm really delighted to see more and more um, case study approaches where we're trying to actually document and make sense of um, this, this extreme event that we've just experienced. So people in the future can go back to that, go, oh, that's really interesting. Um, you know, that was the number of pyro CBs. That was the relationship to the pyro CB events and climate and fire weather and fuel type and so on. So this uh, other approach is what I call cross-cultural action research. Um, and it involves a program we've been doing here in Tasmania. We've been rekindling Tasmanian Aboriginal fire management. Uh, we know the Tasmanian Aborigines used fire skillfully and extensively to modify Tasmanian landscapes. And a whole variety of uh, wonderful circumstances. We've been able to run a project with the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. We've made a film uh, about this. Um, and what we did was we basically embedded culture and you know a, a cultural dimension into basically a fire research project. Um, and in some ways, the spin-offs from that engagement with the Tasmanian Aboriginal community and the farmer whose land we worked, I think is a bigger outcome than actually the science that we will eventually publish. So the third approach, thinking about pyrogeography, is communication. So the problem with communication, as we're learning, is that there's a, a potential double bind risk where you, you might be communicating authoritarian messages, you shall do this now. But on the other hand, you're communicating messages that the community must take responsibility. And that's a double bind. Enter, don't enter. Um, you know, that sends the recipients of a double bind message. Either they become cynical, disengaged, uh, despairing or they just ignore all of the advice. So we really have to think about tailoring messages for the community to make certain that we're building capacity, not uh, actually disempowering people. So uh, theorists have thought about this, uh, the top-down approach versus the more people-centered approach, which creates a virtuous cycle where everybody works together as a whole, self-educating each other to get the outcomes we need. And I think that we really, in fire science and fire management, we really need to, to work with um, social scientists to better understand how we can do this. And an example uh, has been a spin-off. We developed uh, the Aerator app, which I might add, uh, the Aerator app is a tool to help people manage exposure to atmospheric hazards, including smoke. I might add the Aerator app was pressed into service during the smoke crisis in New South Wales. Uh, it's been a very successful tool and a way of building capacity in the community. We also believe it's a very important tool to help fire managers uh, help the community manage their exposure to smoke from planned burning programs. So it's a very explicit way where fire managers can support the community by saying, yes, there's going to be necessary smoke exposure, but we're trying to give you some tools here 
to manage your risk. And from that, we developed a smartphone app called Fireboss. It's now called Firewatch, working closely with uh, TAS Fire Service in beta testing. And one of the things we want to do with this app eventually is to use it because of the crosstalk, the two-way interaction between the user and the disseminator of information is to start building communities, to start allowing communities to self-organise. And one of the cool things is that, again, it comes back to thinking about your paradigms, thinking about your conceptual models. What's a community? There may be in any one physical location, there may be several communities. And that's okay. And in, in a virtual system, you could have the one town, but you might have four communities because they're the people who want to self-organise. They're comfortable with each other. They don't want to be with those other people. They don't agree with them or they're just not on their wavelength or they're just different in some way. They want to be different from them. And that's okay that we can um, develop uh, different communities and build practice of communities uh, amongst uh, communities we can build these different practices, help people adapt to fire risk and fire preparation. So the last example is applied transdisciplinary research. What we've been doing here in Hobart is we've been looking at, with the city of Hobart, the green fire breaks, which are already in situ and building more. We did a social survey, pilot social survey, We've done some fuel and flammability assessments. These are ongoing. Uh, evaluation of how people feel about different fuel assessments, considering biodiversity, historical context. We're then going to be moving. Uh, soon we're recruiting a PhD student to look at fire behaviour modelling to allow scenario planning to build social licence to say, look, Hobart's going to have to look different. Interface is going to have to look different. We're going to do, you know, more fuel treatment. Some of it's burning, some of it's mechanical. We're, we're going to do this. We need to understand. We need the community to understand why we're doing this. We want people to be on the journey, not to be force-fed our solution. We want to be able to adapt, modify, um, enhance our fuel treatments to really take the community in that virtuous cycle that I, I described, take the community from the dangerous place we're in to a safer place. And one of the really cool things about our preliminary study, and I might add it's been reported back to the alderman um, uh, of the city of Hobart, very fascinated by our work, that there was actually an overwhelming desire for green fire breaks. But we also, unexpectedly disclosed psychosocial stress. Um, this was, uh, we did the survey following the 2019 fires uh, and it was last year, which seems like 100 years ago because there's been so much else happening in our world. Um, and I assure you the 2019 Tasmanian fires were a very big deal before they were um, overwritten by the pandemic and also by the 2000 and 1920 mainland fires. But this, uh, one of the things when we started the survey, people, uh, in, a, in a sense, you know, walking the walk, they wrote back and said, look, we love the survey, but we want, there's no provision for comment. We want to comment. So we put in a comment box. And we got pages and pages of people wanting to write down what they felt, uh, which was awesome for textual analysis. The social scientists could study this material. And one of the, I think, the really emblematic uh, responses, as a result of this recent fire season, we've made a decision to move from where we live to a location that is not in proximity to a large area of bush. And that's just like, wow, that's just visceral, it's real. You know, there's something out there that we didn't all of the fire managers said, look, you're wasting your time. Communities disengage. They don't want fuel treatment. And, in fact, they want fuel treatment. In fact, some people are so scared they want to move. They can't stay where they are. <clears throat> now, this has become 
I think a really exciting opportunity that we can now uh, enhance marsupial lawns, which have uh, organically developed around Hobart on the fire breaks built after the, the 1967 fires. Uh, we can tell these ideas, tell the story of these amazing fuel breaks that develop because we're so lucky we don't have foxes. We've got high density of herbivores. We have herbivores. I've got herbivores in my street. The native herbivores run down my street <laughs> um, all the time. You know, it's a real partly related to the drought conditions that wallabies and paddy melons have just become part of the streetscape of Hobart now as they search for green food and water because of our, our anomalous dryness as we've had. We've only had a few big rain bursts and everything else is basically bone dry. <clears throat> so there's an opportunity in this potentially uh, to renew Aboriginal firescapes around Hobart. How exciting would that be to, to join all of this together to actually start transforming the landscape with social licence, involve the Tasmanian Aboriginal community in the program and do it knowing that we're actually changing fire hazard using scientific principles. So this is really an example, I think, of transdisciplinary um, pyrogeographic thinking and it's something that I will be spending uh, a very large chunk of my time doing is this project. This is really probably um, going to be, you know, I, I feel the career highlight of a very marvellously privileged and rich career. <laughs> but I think what's really at stake here is that pyrogeographic thought provides the vision thing. This is a paper we produce uh, with a group of uh, Canadian and American scholars where we were thinking about the problem when you say you've got to change, you don't necessarily show where we should be, the vision thing. So what we did here on the left-hand side is the mess we're in, fires, out of control, you know, smoke, the whole damn thing, you know, it's just a mess. People living in the wrong place. But on the right hand side, look, we could actually get on top of this. We could have, you know, um, way improved uh, urban design. You know, we actually bother to have defendable space, have things like air radar, uh, air filters in homes to help people manage smoke, uh, remove thin down timber. Uh, remove it for bioenergy and have plant burning in the landscape. We, we could do this. Uh, but, but to do it, we need a social license and we need to be signalling to the society that there is a journey that's going to be fun and interesting and transformative and we're going to get from a bad place to a much better place. So the final thought is to do this, we need, I believe, Pyrogeographic training. We need training in transdisciplinary research practice. We need project management skills. We need practitioner experience. We need to have, start having micro credentialing so people can upskill and uh, experiential learning. We need people to be able to learn by doing. So, to, to wrap up, pyrogeographic thinking and the fire crisis. What I would argue is the world we're in, the Anthropocene, involves uh, clearly, as we're seeing with the pandemic, a dynamic constellation of socio-ecological factors. It's not just one factor, it's lots of factors. And we need case studies to organise our thinking so we can understand any particular setting. We've got a context, we've got the ground rules, we can understand what's going on, why is this happening? And that's effectively what those um, inquiries generally do, but they're not done by fire scientists. They're done often by lawyers or, or people who've got more policy clout than fire scientists and fire managers. We need to move, and, and I'm telling practitioners nothing they don't already know, away from problem framing to problem solving. 
And that, I believe, hinges on transdisciplinary training that I've just discussed, clear objectives, engagement with communities, uh, a diversity of practitioners, researchers and communities. That social diversity becomes absolutely critical. That this is a this is the whole society. It's not just one group of specialists or one group of people, you know, got a demarcation dispute. This is actually, we're all in this together. And I think really what I'm wanting to argue is that pyrogeographic thinking can lead to pyrogeographic practice and pyrogeographic outcomes. Um, so, we can actually, as I've illustrated with the Aborigines, we can actually um, do this. And I think that the end point, just if you want to know, you know, where my philosophy, you know, what I try to remind myself of what we should be doing, and, and maybe my, my, you know, um, help orientate. I have this phrase. Uh, actually chiseled in wood above my desk because this is what I think eventually we should be doing affectionately and that means not mechanically but with affection and not just affection but also with reverence with emotion affectional means with emotion not just the not just affectionate emotions reverence pride fear lots of emotions tending the earthly garden with little fires. Because if we do that, we can actually renew not only Aboriginal fire cultures, but indeed um, our European fire cultures that have been overwritten by modernity. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, David. Um, I hope you all found that uh, sort of a, a stimulating um, presentation from David. I'm just going to open the lines up to take any questions. The conference is now in conversation mode. All participants are now unmuted. Okay, does anyone out there have any questions for David? I think they're all in shock from the, the stunningness of your talk, David. Oh, good. I <laughs> I have a question for you. So right now you're sort of the hub of pyrogeography and you're talking about getting it out in community and researchers and practitioners. Yep. What mechanism do you see as being an effective way of doing that? Well, I, I often like to say that, um, and I've done a lot of transdisciplinary um, projects, I, I like to say that often what happens to researchers is that the process becomes the project. So what ends up happening is, you know, set yourself a goal to try to do a project, but actually the bigger outcome is the process of making the project happen. So uh, a way of getting up uh, pyrogeographic capacity is to say, like I'm illustrating with Hobart, right, I, you know, I'm passionate about wanting improved fuel management on the perimeter of Hobart. That's something I am passionate about. So how do I do that? So as a researcher, what I've been doing is that I've built relationships with the city of Hobart. I'm building relationships with the Aboriginal community. You start doing it little by little, and then eventually that process the outcome of that process becomes really significant, not so much the outputs of the little baby step projects. And hopefully that will then coalesce into maybe a major research project and ultimately in a change in research practice. So I don't know whether I've answered your question, but I think it's a case of learning by doing and just realising that every single fire management program we have can also be framed as a way of building capacity and building engagement with different stakeholders, different communities and so on. So not seeing all of those community consultations as just a, 
a transactional cost or a break on the research, seeing them actually is a really important outcome. So you could use existing, say, um, community consultation that's done through for prescribed burning or planned burning consultation as a mechanism to getting back out into the community with some of this thinking? Absolutely, and that's, that's a really good point. But, you know, there's opportunities galore. Um, if you think about, you know, planned burning programs, um, you could, if you, if you could create the time and the space and the cultural, the culture in our craft, in our practice, to say, look, why aren't we having a student embedded in this project? Why aren't we going to the universities and saying, look, we're doing this awesome project around Bendigo or, or Castle, Maine or, you know, Newcastle, I don't know, and, and we're going to be doing these interventions. Let's create a space and a role and a budget for a student, at least, to be part of the program and let them try to document some facet of that research, not all of it, some facet of it. Let's start embedding and the diversity, you know, let's, you know, let's try to make certain that in our um, work that we have more Aboriginal people, more women, more people who've got different um, perspectives, you know, from different cultural backgrounds. If we can have these people involved in our teams and ideally people reflecting on the practice, reporting back, creating opportunities for taste notes and um, reflection and seeing that as really valuable, um, not just a questionnaire and ticking boxes, but really trying to encourage people to discuss and debate how to think through these issues. If you read... Christine Erickson's book um, shares this wonderful uh, uh, description of uh, men and women uh, firefighters on a, on a fire ground having some time out talking about something they shared in common. And I think it was baking or something. So, so that sort of, that could be just sort of like, oh yeah, that's, that's nothing. But actually, it's everything because it's building lines of communication. It's building uh, increased capacity in our craft and in our discipline for diversity um, because that diversity will help shape our practice and help better engage with the community. Great. Uh, does anyone out online have any questions they'd like to put to David? Okay, well, in that case, I'll uh, wrap up the webinar and we'll all give David a round of applause virtually, as is the case in these pandemic days. And um, uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. I really appreciate it, Deb, and uh, full marks for making this happen. I really appreciate no it. Good on you. No thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Right. Be safe.